Well, what's going on, you guys? So a few weeks ago, my friend Amanda recommended this book to me. It's called Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things. The author is Jenny Lawson. The reason Amanda recommended this to me is because she knows uh, that my channel is about my mental health, what I do to keep myself sane, keep myself happy, keep myself pushing forward, and recenter my brain every week. I go out on a hike. I will go camping. Um, I will go out exploring. Heck, even just for a plain and simple walk or sitting and having coffee and conversation out in the, the woods or something. Uh, I like to be out there having the fresh air. But again, the book is called Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things by Jenny Lawson. On the back, there's a couple things I want to read to you. There's a quote and what the book is about. In Furiously Happy, the author Jenny Lawson explores her lifelong battle with mental illness, a hysterical, ridiculous book about crippling depression and anxiety. That sounds like a terrible idea, but terrible ideas are what Jenny does best. A quote by Jenny. Most of my favorite people are dangerously fucked up, but you'd never guess it because we've either become adept at hiding it or we've learned to bear it so honestly that it becomes the new normal. There's a quote from The Breakfast Club that goes, we're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it. I have it on a poster, but I took a Sharpie to it and scratched out the word hiding. So every week uh, I will be, or actually kind of when I feel like it, um, I will be reading a chapter out of this book. There is quotes in this, so I will be emphasizing the quotes. So, and bear with me, some words I might not be able to pronounce, uh, and I might kind of stutter a little bit because sometimes my brain just gets ahead of itself. Uh, part of my mental health is my anxiety and my gears just turn way too fast. So here we go. Chapter one, furiously happy, dangerously sad. You're not crazy. Stop calling yourself crazy. My mom says for the 11 billionth time, you're just sensitive and a little odd and fucked up enough to require an ass load of meds. I add, that's not crazy, my mom says as she turns back to scrubbing the dishes. You're not crazy, and you need to stop saying that you are. It makes you sound like a lunatic. I laugh because this is a familiar argument. This is the same one we've had millions of times before, and the same one we'll have million times over again. So, I let it lie. Besides, she's technically right. I'm not technically crazy, but crazy is a much simpler way of labeling what I really am. According to my many shrinks I have seen in the last two decades, I am a high-functioning, depressive with severe anxiety disorder, moderate clinical depression, and mild self-harm issues that stem from an impulse control disorder. I have avoidant personality disorder, which is like social anxiety disorder on speed, and occasional depersonalization disorder, which makes me feel utterly detached from reality, but in less of a this is L this LSD is awesome kind of way and more of a I wonder what my face is doing right now and it sure would be nice to feel emotions again sort of thing. I have rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune issues, and sprinkled in like paprika over mentally un unbalanced deviled eggs are things like mild OCD and trichotillomania, the urge to pull one's hair out, which is always nice to end on. Which, because whenever people hear the word mania, they automatically back off and give you more of your own room on crowded airplanes. Because you're not supposed to talk about having manias when you're on crowded airplanes. This is one of the reasons why my husband, Victor, hates to fly with me. The other reason is I often fly with taxidermied creatures as anxiety service animals. Basically, we don't travel a lot together because he doesn't understand awesomeness. You're not a maniac, my mom says in an aggravated voice. You just don't, you just like to pull your hair. You didn't even, you did it when you were even little. It's just soothing to you, like, like petting a kitten. I like to pull my hair out, I clarify. It's sort of different. That's why they call it a mania, not kitten petting disorder, which would honestly suck to have because then you'd end up with a bunch of semi-bald kittens who would hate you. My God, 
I hope I never get overly enthusiastic kitten fur pulling disorder. My mother deeply, my mother sighs deeply, but this is exactly why I love having these conversations with her, because she she gives me perspective. It's also why she hates having these conversations with me, because I give her details. You are perfectly normal, my mom says, shaking her head as her body won't even let her get away with this sort of lie. I laugh as I tug involuntarily at my hair. I have never been normal, and I think we both know that. My mom pauses for a moment, trying to think up of another line of defense, but it's pretty hopeless. I've always been naturally anxious to, ridic to ridiculous degrees. My earliest school memory is of a field trip to a hospital when a doctor pulled out some blood samples and I immediately passed out right into a wall of thankfully empty bedpans. According to other kids present, a teacher said, ignore her, she just wants attention. Then my head started bleeding, and the doctor cracked open an ammonia capsule under my nose, which is a lot like being punched in the face by an invisible fist of stink. Honestly, I didn't know why I'd pass out. My baseline of anxiety remained the same, but my subconscious was apparently so terrified that it decided that the safest place for me was to be fast asleep on the floor surrounded by bedpans, which sort of shows why my body is an idiot because forced narcolepsy is pretty much the worst defense ever. It's like, it's like a human version of playing possum, which is only helpful if bears are trying to eat you, because apparently, if you lie down in front of bears, they're all, what a badass, I attack her and she takes a cat nap. I probably shouldn't fuck with her. This would be the part of the long, ridiculous period of my life, which shrinks label white coat syndrome. My family referred to it as, what the hell is wrong with Jenny syndrome? I think my family was more accurate in their assessment because passing out when you see doctor's coats is just damn ridiculous and more than slightly embarrassing, especially later when you have to say, sorry, I passed out on you. Apparently, I'm afraid of coats. To make things even worse, when I pass out, I tend to flail about on the floor. Apparently, I moan gutturally, like a Frankenstein, according to my mom, who has witnessed uh, this on several occasions. Other people might battle subconscious fear of adversity, failure, or being stoned to death, but my hidden phobia t makes me faint at the sight of outerwear. I passed out once at the optometrist, twice at the dentist's office, and two horrifying times at the gynecologist. The nice thing about passing out at the gynecologist, though, is that if you're already in stirrups, you don't have to fa far to fall, unless, of course, you're like me and you flail about wildly while you're moaning and unconscious. It's pretty much the worst way to pass out with someone in your vagina. It's like having a really unattractive orgasm that you're not even awake for. I always remind my gynecologist that I might rather loudly pass out during a pap smear and then she usually grimly informs me that she didn't need me to remind her at all. Probably, my sister says, because most people don't make much of a theatrical show about fainting. The, the really bad part about passing out at the gynecologist is that you s occasionally, sorry, you occasionally regain consciousness with an unexpected speculum inside your vagina, which is essentially the third worst way to wake up. The second worst way to wake up is at the gynecologist without a speculum inside of you because the gynecologist took it out when you were passed out and now you have to start all over again, which is why I always tell gynecologists that if I pass out when they're in my vagina, they should just take the opportunity to get everything out of the way while I'm out. The first worst way to wake up is to find bears eating you because your body thought it was safest defense was to sleep in front of bears. That playing possum? Bullshit. Almost never works. Not that I know because I never pass out in front of bears because that would be ridiculous. In fact, I've actually been known to run at bears to get a good picture of them. Instead, I pass out in front of coats, which according to my brain are the things you really need to be concerned about. <laughs> One time, I loudly lost consciousness at, consciousness at my veterinarian's office when he called my name. Apparently, my subconscious freaked out when I saw blood on the vet's coat, and I abruptly passed out right on my cat. That's not a euphemism. 
I woke up shirtless in the lobby with a bunch of strangers and dogs looking down at me. Evidently, when I started moaning, the vet called an ambulance, and when the EMTs arrived, they claimed they couldn't find my heartbeat, so they ripped open my shirt. Personally, I think they just wanted a cheap thrill. I think the dogs looking down at me agreed, as they seemed slightly embarrassed for me after watching me, watching the whole spectacle unfold. But you really can't blame the dogs, because first of all, who can look away from a train wreck like that? And secondly, dogs have no concept of modesty. Waking up shirtless with a bunch of concerned dogs staring at your bra because you're afraid of coats is about the seventh worst way to wake up. I, mutter, I muttered aloud to my mother. Hmm. My opinion replies noncommittedly, raising a single eyebrow. Well, okay, maybe you're not normal normal, she says grudgingly. But who wants to be normal? You're fine. You're perfectly fine, better than normal even, because you're so aware of what's wrong with you that you can recognize it and sort of fix it. I nod. She has a point, although the rest of the world might disagree with her and our definition of fixing it. When I was little, I fixed it by hiding, by hiding from the world in an empty toy box whenever my undiagnosed anxiety got too unbearable. In high school, I fixed it by isolating myself from other people. In college, I fixed it with eating disorders, controlling what I ate to compensate for lack of control I felt with my emotions. Now, as an adult, I control it with medication and with shrink visits and with beha behavioral therapy. I control it by being painfully honest about just how crazy I am. I control it by allowing myself to hide in bathrooms and under tables during important events. And sometimes I control it by letting it control me because I have no other choice. Sometimes I'm, I'm unable to get out of bed for a week at a time. Anxiety attacks are all still uncomfortable and terrifying part of my life. But after a fiercely happy epiphany, I've learned the importance of pushing through, knowing that one day soon I'll be happy again. If this sentence seems confusing, it's probably because you skipped over the author's note at the beginning like everyone else did. At, at the beginning, like everyone else in the world does. Go back and read it because it's important because you might find money in there. Doubtful. I split through the pages, didn't find no money. Continuing on, last few paragraphs of this chapter. This is why I sneak into other people's bathrooms in haunted hotels and once accepted a job as a political CZAR. Is it CZ? I don't know how to pronounce that, so I'm not even going to try. CZAR, who reports directly to the stray cat that sleeps in City Hall. I have staged live zombie apocalypse drills in crowded ballrooms, and I have landed on aircraft carriers at sea. I once crowdfunded an event enough money to buy a taxidermy Pegasus. I am furiously happy. It's not a cure of mental illness. It's a weapon designed to counter it. It was a way to take back some of the joy that's robbed from you when you're crazy. Ah, you're not crazy, my mom says again, waving a wet plate at me. Stop saying you're crazy. People will think you are a lunatic. And it's true, they will. I googled the word lunatic on my phone and read her one of the definitions lunatic noun wildly or giddily foolish my mom pauses stares at me finally sighs in recognition recognizing way too much of me that recognizing way too much of me in that definition huh she says shrugging thoughtfully as she turns back to the sink so maybe crazy isn't bad after all i agree Sometimes crazy is just right. That's the end of chapter one, guys. Thanks for listening.